Hey, nice to meet you. So, where is here? Who is here? Esther, Kathleen, who else? Mike. Mike. So, well, we're going to welcome people as they come a little bit. We do a little talk like this at the beginning, right? And today, so I'm Ferret. Uh, I'm going to repeat my name a few times for those newcomers who are going to arrive afterwards. I'm Ferret. Uh, I'm a tour guide in Paris for the last five years. I have had the joy to be able to work for Travel Couriers for a little while and uh, offering crazy experience uh, from hotels here in Paris. And um, I would like to thank uh, Travel Couriers to offer us uh, the guides, uh, the opportunity. It's not too much about uh, financial opportunity, but it's much more about sharing our passion and, uh, and about what we learn I mean the passion for knowledge that we have got here. Knowledge is quite the theme today because we're in the Latin Quarter of Paris. And uh, so I would like to invite you to follow the hashtag Stay Curious or to go on the website www.staycurious.com to go to watch other videos of some of my colleagues all around Europe. It's going to go on uh, twice a week during the confinement. So. Uh, well, take that chance. It's a free video. You can go on live chats. You can exchange with the guys just like what you are doing right now with me. So it's going to be an amazing opportunity for us to meet. We are not obliged to do social distancing in that matter. We can just be physically distanced from one another and keep exchanging. So please ask questions. Today we are not alone. We are with my wife uh, that you can see actually on the other side. And um, and so she she helped me to be the one I am today. Uh, we met five years ago, and this is the moment I decided to become a tour guide. My dad wanted me to become an engineer, so I kind of did. I didn't complete the, the master's degree; I just have a bachelor in production management. And um, and I worked in a shoe shining factory, and then I quit. I was traveling Europe, taking night trains from time to time because they were cheap. And I met her in a night train between Belgrade and Sofia. And then we came back, almost forced her to marry me in Paris. And that's it, romantic boy coming from here. And now it has been like uh, almost perfect for the last five years, but I still have to make some effort. Well, eventually, what have we got here? Latin Quarter. And the Latin Quarter is the, the heart of the city of Paris. And like in terms of history of France, it's also a really important neighborhood. Paris almost started around here, right? People say it started over there on the island where Notre Dame is. I mean, today, I forgot to uh, tell you uh, where we were. We are at uh, Chez Odette, which is uh, my favorite, one of my top three favorite cream puff shops. So I've got the chance to have these today, right? And uh, well, eventually, um, we have got this wonderful shop behind me. Maybe we can go a bit behind so you can see the the front of the shop which is in the 17th century building and this square is what I call the crossroad of the Latin Quarter so you can see just behind us on the other side you can see Notre Dame right the amazing Notre Dame the heart of Paris which is right there you can see on this one on this side you can see Saint Severin a late Gothic uh, church that has been built around 1480s and they shot the movie the interview with a vampire right there and uh, you have jazz clubs, you have this lovely street of the, um, of the Latin Quarter right there. And uh, this is where we are. So how did it all start? It all started with uh, the Romans, right? You, can you name me a guy, right, who gave his name to a palace, to uh, a salad, right? Caesar, right? Julius Caesar, crown of laurels, very, very Vinci, right? I came, I saw, I conquered. And when Paris became Roman, eventually, you would have like Roman baths. If you go like few streets away that direction, boom, Roman baths. If you are uh, like that street, maybe we can come to that street. And in that street, it's called Rue Saint-Jacques. It's called the Cardo Maximus. And this is like when the Romans come somewhere, they draw a cross with the forum, the center of political, uh, commercial, religious, um, entity of, of the city. And they put it at a crossing of two major streets. And right now, we are stepping. You can come in much further. There is nobody on the road. You can come to see that street. That is a 2,000 year old street. It has been like drawn on a map, a map 2,000 years ago. And so we've got the luck to see also on that street a wonderful little tower. Can you see that tower? It's the tower of the astrological tower 
of the Sorbonne University. The Latin Quarter has got a tremendous history of students and university. What is this all about? Come back with me because we are on the road right now, it's going to be tricky, right? So, um, well, the Romans, they standardized their city. Everything is the same everywhere you go. And uh, at some point, the Roman Empire, like, uh, even though they bring like these wonderful aqueducts, roads, uh, they also bring baths. Uh, the baths of Paris, can you see like there is a, a big tree just behind the building, just behind that row of buildings, right? You have the Roman baths. It's called the firms of Cluny uh, because the building was, um, was what was uh, recycled later on. Eventually, uh, the Romans, they give this uh, access to wonderful uh, um, baths, uh, libraries, all of these like uh, or like uh, Colosseum, right? Uh, like here, amphitheaters, right? We can have like gladiator fighters. So eventually everything is nice, but everything that has a beginning has an end. And in around the 5th century, the Roman Empire is going to collapse. Because sometimes people mention these uh, barbarians, uh, Attila the Hun, for example. And Attila the Hun, yes, uh, early 5th century, destabilized the, the forces of Rome by attacking it by the gold, where we are right now, France. And did he destroy Paris? Of course not, right? There is one lady, a Persian girl. I mean, Persian girls have been tough for the last 2,000 years, right? At least 1,500 years, because she's called Genevieve. And she's around 18, 19 years old. We don't know exactly her birth date. But what happened to her? She convinced people. I mean, I mean, imagine this. 1,500 years ago, 1,600 years ago, about that girl convinced the people here, I mean, tough guys, you know, to actually uh, knee down and pray a God that nobody, not everybody was building in it, right? It was Christianity was already like starting as a, it was already Christianized, but not everybody was, was Christian yet. And, uh, and like convincing everybody in Paris to knee down and pray against the Huns. And guess what? It worked. And because of that, she became the saint patron of the city of Paris. So eventually, we have got a saint patron of our city. We have got a church uh, dedicated to her, which is at the top of the Latin Quarter, and that church is called the Pantheon. The Pantheon is a name, it's not called just St. Genevieve Church anymore, it has been changed during the French Revolution, where revolutionaries decided that they were going to bury the most important people uh, of uh, our country, our nation, France, right? People like Voltaire, like Rousseau, but also like people like Marie Curie. Do you know her, right? Not only she got one Nobel Prize as a woman, but two Nobel Prize. And like, this was kind of amazing woman uh, discovering about uh, the nuclear uh, functions, but also a man called Victor Hugo. You know him, right? Personally, maybe not, but he's the one, thanks to who, I would say we still have the Latin Quarter and we still have Notre Dame today. So let's take a look at Notre Dame a little bit. So when you're looking at Notre Dame, what have we got here? Notre Dame, amazing thing. Uh, Notre Dame is this, uh, is this amazing church built between the late 1100s, uh, finished until the, like finished 1345, about 182 years to finish that church it was quite tough. To be honest with you, after 50, 60 years, the cathedral was done and it was just additions. Well, eventually, that church during the French Revolution was turned into the Temple of Reason. They used it to, to store wine, goods, horses. It was like uh, terrifying. They destroyed many statues, beheaded all the kings that are on the facade, the kings that were the kings of the Old Testament. And so they hesitated at the French Revolution to keep it or not. They said, should we uh, destroy Notre Dame? Can you imagine this today? I mean, when it burns. Year ago, people were about to send billions of euros to save it. But in the 1800s, just after the French Revolution, people would look at it and they would say, Oh my god, this is so 1340s. And people didn't like that style anymore. And thanks to Victor Hugo, he wrote his book, right, 1830s. He wrote his book called The Hinchback of Notre Dame. And thanks to that book, you can have Notre Dame still today standing. And what's happening with that? Well, Notre Dame is saved, and thanks to that we can remember how it started and why the Latin Quarter is Latin Quarter. 1100s, we have this man called Maurice de Sully. Those who are familiar with French, 
uh, they will notice that there is a little de in the middle of that name. It doesn't mean uh, that he is a noble. It just means that he came from there in this case, right? Nobles usually also use this, but he just came from there. And he came bare feet to the city of Paris. I mean, can you imagine that? A son of a woodcutter and a cleaning lady became the bishop of the capital of the country and even maybe the confessor of the king uh, who actually financed the project a lot. And so that man developed the school of the cathedral of Notre Dame which still exists today. You can go to the Collège des Bernardins. I'm going to come back on that if you need. And you can still study theology and philosophy like a street away from here where we are standing. So you look at Notre Dame, you go back and you will be able to see that. So eventually, what's happening next? You have uh, the school of Notre Dame bragging, like a l bringing a lot of students to the neighborhood and to the church. And what's happening with that is that uh, there is not enough monks or priests inside the school of the church for everybody. So a lot of them actually, or like nearby churches, they start to give theological courses as well. And I would just like, I would look at this little street over here, because when you come there, you have like these narrow streets without an end, right? It's not a, a grid system yet, right? This is like all turning street everywhere around. When you come here, what have you got? Imagine packs of students trying to study in front, like having like a oral course uh, with their teachers, right? Learning about the Bible and theology, and that was it. And so you would like gather a few students one next to another, choose a, a, a professor, and with that on, you would be able to uh, actually do what? You would be actually to study the Bible. And you still have to pay at that moment of history, right? And so not everybody can study the Bible. The problem with that is that until the 15th century, the Bible is still in Latin. So it's reserved to an elite. But a man decided that everybody should be able to study the Bible. So if you had goodwill, if you were smart, you would be able to go and study the Bible and to theology, philosophy, music, astronomy, you would be able to go to the uh, College of Sorbonne. And so the man who started it is called Robert Sorbonne, which later on became La Sorbonne, right? It's one of the oldest university in the world. You have Bologna, you have Oxford, and you have the Sorbonne University. And where is that guy coming from, Robert Sorbonne? He's also coming from a really poor background. That man actually uh, was really poor, and he even had to beg at the beginning of his theological studies, right? to be able to get to study the Bible and theology. So he became the chamberlain, the main priest of a tiny chapel, which is nearby. When you go on the island, you have like Notre Dame, which is on the island, and you go to the Saint Chapel. And eventually the Saint Chapel is basically uh, a box of metal and stained glass windows, a golden cage in a way, with all the stories of the Bible put in stained glass windows all around and this is a uh, kind of an amazing scene you have to remember 11th century we have the beginning of the crusades 1090s and people thought that because of misbelievers right people from other religions that jerusalem was taken that the end of the world was near so we need to study the bible save the souls of many people as many people as we can and jerusalem being lost in the iconography, we discovered the Jerusalem of the sky. And this is what you can see when you look at the former facade of Notre Dame. I really invite you to go online and type facade Notre Dame colors, and you will see pictures of crazy colors of what could have been the facade of Notre Dame. And the Saint Chapel is also amazing because you can see it's really one of the, it's not too much visited. Over a million people visit it in a year. I gave that to you. But 14 million visitors go to Notre Dame. And out of these million visitors, you have a good 40, 50% of them who are French. So it's like something that not too many people get to see and understand. You could read the Bible like in a book over there. So it's nice. And this man started the universities almost for free. And we still have this in our culture today. It all starts from the Latin Quarter that we have these kind of free universities going around. So right now, next to St. Chapel, what have we got? We have got the Conciergerie. And the Conciergerie is this place which was the former Palace of the Kings until the 1300s when they moved to the Louvre. And this was um, a moment 
uh, this was like transformed afterwards into what? Into a palace of justice and a jail. And you have had famous people going into that place, uh, people such as Marie Antoinette, the last queen of France before the first French Revolution. We had like several kings and queens afterwards, three of them, but uh, she's the last queen before the French Revolution, the, the only queen that has been beheaded. And she spent the last weeks of her life over here. And if you move a bit further down, if you come over here, you see the streets over there? If you go like that direction, you go further, about half a mile away, you will go to the oldest coffee of Paris. It's called the Procop. The Procop is named after the man who started it, Eugene Procopio. And this man started the first coffee of Paris. So let's remind where we are. Latin Quarter, we had Chaudet, one of the best cream puffs of Paris, my favorite one, in front of a wonderful terrace that has been just set up for us. And I really thank the owners for this. And, uh, and we have this tradition of really enjoying our time and loving coffee places since that moment. In that coffee shop, you would have all the enlightenments going in, right? People like Voltaire, Rousseau would have been there, but also major key players of the French Revolution, such as who? Such as Marat. Maybe you know this guy who was like murdered in his bathtub, such as Danton, such as Robespierre, the man who commissioned, who ordered the reign of terror to happen. Thanks to who, actually, we have had so many, thanks to who, uh, because of who we have had so many heads of, of people beheaded in Paris, right? My Antoinette was beheaded, if you have seen the movie uh, with Anna Ferre, right? The Devil West Prada, where she throws her cell phone right inside the, inside the, the, the fountain, right? Next to an obelisk. And so, well, uh, this is only one of the few squares that the guillotine was held and where these people, in, and including themselves at the end of the French Revolution of Terror, that uh, were beheaded. If you want to see a real guillotine, you have to come to Latin Quarter though. Because today, no guillotine are displayed uh, in Paris, anywhere else, but in the police station of this neighborhood. You can see on these uh, street plates, right? Can you see that? We are Rue Galande. And there is a little number on top of the street, right? I'd say it's number five, right? This is the fifth district of Paris. We have got 20 districts inside our city. And uh, what happened is that these, uh, these districts are like all of their police station, their city hall. It's like a city in a city. And the police station of the fifth district, the one we are in of the Latin Quarter, has got a guillotine, a blade of a guillotine, what you call the coupre which was actually, which is an actual one. And this one was used in front of the city hall of Paris because the guillotine moved several times. And then a man took it at the end of its use, of its use and hid it in his basement. And the basement is right there in the Caveau des Oubliettes. So when you go here today, it's a jazz club. It's an amazing club to be in. And you can go to the basement of it and have a look of what used to be former cells of a little castle that used to stand here and eventually enjoy the, the jazz and remember that there was a guillotine like kept right here which is kind of crazy when you think about it and they were displaying it for a while inside the jazz shop so what's happening next what's happening next is that when you're moving forward back and forth in terms of history the the, the influence of latin quarter right didn't stop here. You have like elements of a culture that still depend on it. When you have, for example, like uh, when you have several colleges, the Sorbonne, of course, but there is another one, for example, College de Beauvais, which is another city next to Paris. And you have a guy who studied in that, who I really love, one of my favorite theater character called Cyrano de Bergerac. And Cyrano is uh, this man with the massive nose, he's a fighter, he's a poet. And that man with the massive nose is like uh, uh, really existed and he went to study in that specific college just nearby inside the Latin Quarter. And um, when you come here, when you remember the street that we passed by, 2000 year old street in the 1500s, it was the main arterial of the Latin Quarter. All the bookstores that were here, more than 150 bookshops and, uh, and edition companies were here. And eventually, still today, you have many bookshops on the other side of the squares over here. And, uh, and we all have this uh, also because of literature. Victor Hugo saved it in the 1850s, 60s, 70s. 
We destroyed 70% of Paris. This was coming next. And thanks to him, we preserved the remainings of our history, whether they were Roman, Gothic, and, uh, and we still have today several bookshops that are really important, such as Shakespeare and Company. So when you go to Shakespeare and Company, it's a bookshop that's like just around the block over here, if you want to follow me. Shakespeare and Company is a, a shop that was started in 1919 and that last the original one until 1941 the woman who started it is called sylvia beach and she started to publish really soon early 1920s uh books of james joyce for example she's the first one to publish james joyce ulysses and um she had like ernest Hemingway, ezra pounds fitzgerald right they all passed by there and get who stein as well in the original shop it has changed since then but eventually you have uh around this shop uh, like all these walls are still uh, vibrating with these people living in the, in the roaring 20s. The lost generation took his name because of Gertrude Stein who named the lost generation, the people, the writers who went through the first world war from that specific shop. And so today the shop you see is a bit different, it's not at the same location as well. You have um, during second world war in 1941 uh, German officer who comes inside a shop and tries to buy a book from her and she refused to sell him that specific book inside Shakespearean company and because of that they took down the books they burned them and the, she was sent Sylvia Beach to Auschwitz she survived but when she came back she didn't want to reopen it and it's another man called George Whitman who had uh, like the poet Walt Whitman <coughs> who had sorry like spring allergies who had um, uh, the desire, who already had a shop here called the Mestrol, and uh, it's the name of a wind in the south of France, and who reopened the shop in the 1960s, and since then, it's his daughter actually now who is owning the shop. It has been a living socialist kind of utopia, because anywhere you come from in, in this, from this planet, you can ask them to spend a night on one of their couches, actually. And this is where I learned English. You know, French people speak really bad English, usually. And it's like, uh, I'm not exception to this. I can take my really bad French accent, actually. But what's important here is that if you want, you can like, you have to read a book a day, you have to help a few hours, you have to write one page of your autobiography. And have a look at this building, which dates from the 17th century. Eventually, uh, you can come and sleep here for as long as you need. Usually people don't stay too long, some people only spend one night, others stay three months. But it's uh, an amazing place and it keeps the spirit of the Latin Quarter. Coming back to the First and the Second World War. During the First World War, what did we have? What happened here? What kind of change happened to the to Latin Quarter? During the First World War, I have to pay a tribute to this uh, specific regiment of black American soldiers called the uh, Harlem Hellfighters. And thanks to a man called Reese Europe, eventually, who like teamed up a brass band uh, in this unit, we have jazz in Paris. This came, the jazz came in France, thanks to that specific unit of infantry. And uh, they were like the first foreign infantry to, be, to receive a cross. La Croix de Fer, uh, and so it's like a, a specific uh, Medal of Honor coming from the French Army, and thanks to that, you have many jazz clubs in Paris that started from this. And like, um, we didn't have segregation. We didn't have segregation in France at that moment, even though I mean we are not completely uh, clean on our history here. But eventually, you still had more freedom uh, to for for the the. the you see a lot of freedom for these black Americans to come and many of them came to set up like their career and uh, you had also writers like Richard Wright uh, like if you see like Native Son for example if you read that book it has been written while he was in Paris and he finished his life here so you have all of these little elements that add up together and makes Latin Quarter what it is everywhere you go you will find like these little secret things like this you remember that like Prokop the coffee I talked about actually if you're interested into Napoleon you should go back there and watch that wonderful hat of Napoleon because that guy was broke from time to time and uh, he has not always been this great emperor as we know. I mean, great. I'm the same size, right? One, five feet seven, but 168 meter. 
And so you can see one of his hats inside the um, inside the, the inside that wonderful coffee shop actually, the oldest coffee shop of Paris. So if we have to wrap up for that in quarter. So again World War, civil fights took place right here here. You have like the the, the East Paris burning movie. And people are still keeping their spirit of freedom, of uh, of knowledge you can still see on the side of the river for example these green booths over there these are the bookinis the people selling books so on like normally on sunny days like this you would have like flocking of people trying to buy uh, old uh, uh, antique books actually from Paris and uh, Notre Dame is still standing the symbol of Paris is still standing one of the symbols of Paris is still standing and uh, I would really uh, <laughs> encourage you to, to come back to Paris. Come to me for two seconds. We are going to go back to the shop and uh, I really would like to thank them to have provided us a place to sit and to, because we don't have the right to walk around too much like this during confinement. Of course, we have to stay safe and, and respect the rules that are given to us. And right now, if you have any questions about anything, that's your moment, right? Uh, do you have a any questions for can you can you hear me some of the questions I'm here I can like answer you anything you have about what's your life, favorite restaurant Paris. in Paris my favorite restaurant so my uh, there is a when you go here I mean let's stay in the Latin Quarter uh, I there is one restaurant that I really like it's called Allard and uh, they provide an amazing duck with olives that you should try I really like tartars you have like les tontons which I really like and uh, these are like rather affordable prices but well it's still uh, really good I mean affordable in a way right if you go to the restaurant once every two three weeks that would be the restaurant you go and it's really French I would really recommend you to do this but otherwise every single neighborhood of Paris has got one favorite restaurant but here go to Allard go to um, go to these uh, Tata places what else uh, how long is like you were well tell me yes so about uh, I, I heard uh, there was like um, there was like from a previous talk some of you were interested about the restoration of Notre Dame let's have a quick look at this for two seconds because don't be shy when you look at the when you look at the Notre Dame right now you can see the structure of the, the roof right which is like protecting it from the rain and also balancing the way of it. You see a new scaffolding uh, surrounding the old one. You can see also the flying buttresses and on the flying buttress underneath it, you can see like a massive structure of wood that helps to support the church. Normally, we're supposed to know right now uh, in March, actually a month ago, a uh, height was going to be uh, to, um, to how, how long it was going to be to restore Notre Dame. And what happened is that uh, it has been posed of cause of COVID, but they're still working on it. They came back to it to work on it. So uh, it's, uh, we should know soon how long it, it's going to take to restore it. And to be fair with you, there was this crazy product about glass, rooftop. We don't know. Like nobody knows. And there is a lot of political issues about what to do. And so eventually, uh, we are going to, uh, to know really soon how long it's going to take. But I remember there was... Um, uh, a webinar with one of the archaeologists of the National Research Center of Science in France, CNRS, who actually said that, uh, you know, he had like in his 80s, he's like taking his mark and said, We cannot build Notre Dame. Uh, we cannot take like, uh, it's not going to take five years to build Notre Dame. It's going to take two. Boom. Zugi is my mic drop thing. But well, eventually, it can take two years, it can take five years, it can take 10 years. The goal is not to rush and to do it properly for the next 850 years to come, I would say. So, well, if you have a questions, we can answer it like a bit later, right? Um, besides that, uh, we're going to finish the, 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 the tour right now. Uh, I would like to thank you to be here. I would like to remind you to stay curious, right? You can follow the hashtag stay curious. There is a page uh, on www.staycurious.com. Uh, where you can actually watch all the other videos Travel of, of uh, on, yes www. no it's stakecurious.com and uh, the company is called Travel Curious and uh, you can uh, watch all the other videos made by all my colleagues in Europe 
and if you want you can even leave them a tip as well as you can do it for me uh, but the primary intention with these videos is to keep us active to um, to share with us with you uh, the passion of our cities and we can also answer questions to help you plan a trip and also know that every single tip that you give you will receive a coupon of the exact same value uh, from the company travel curious for any activities you would book in the future it's lifelong valid so um, thank you for being here thank you travel curious to offer me this opportunity to share my passion thanks to Odette um, to, to leave us uh, their terrace, my favorite terrace in the Latin Quarter actually and uh, I wish you a pleasant uh, 1st of May Bye